So what's new? What's new? What are we going to see that's different? Okay. So we're actually going to get to the actual text in a way. Um, as a sidebar, uh, the Bishops' Conference and ISIL completed their last part of their work. What took place was everything went to Rome back last year, uh, 2010. If you recall, uh, Pope Benedict promulgated the, the third edition of the English Missal, Roman Missal, uh, back in April or so. Uh, that's when he actually said, move forward. It's, uh, it's, it's final now in this final version. There's still some things had to take place. Vatican had to work with the version that was sent from the Bishop's Conference. They made various small edits here and there, corrections, and things like that. They sent that back to the Vatican in August. Okay, so in, uh, excuse me, back to the USCCB in August. So ISIL and USCCB then took all of those various corrections and had to put them together. They were trying to get them out for November, so there would be one full year before we implemented the, the, the revised missile. But they weren't able to get to all of the, the adjustments and the edits, uh, last minute edits. So uh, it didn't go out until uh, January, February. So the, the printers will have them but we might not be able to see them or have books in our hands, our own missiles and things like that, until September. Uh, it'll take that long before the publishers are able to, to get it all together. But there's plenty of material out now that shows basically the, the texts that have changed for the most of us uh, in, in the pews, in a sense, the people in the pews. Okay, so sign of the cross, here we go. There's your present text. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and the new text, in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> so. Next slide. <laughs> that, that's a little joke I incorporated into this, but Joan Tracy, who works in my office, is not here today, so I had Corinne helping me, but obviously that didn't get translated across the <laughs> process. But uh, Okay, greeting, here we go. Present text, the Lord be with you. We've already talked about some of this, and also with you. The new text, the Lord be with you and with your spirit. You want to try that? The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. See, you're already there. No problems. All right? Fantastic. Okay. This is a closer translation of the Latin, et cum spiritu tuo, and it matches the response that already exists in most of the major languages already. Okay? The purpose of this greeting is not to just say hello but to also say good morning. I mean, not to also say hello or good morning, but to say something different. It alerts participants that they have entered into this sacramental realm. They have, it reminds us that we have responsibilities here and that we're entering into a time of prayer. So it's not just hello or good morning, it's the Lord be with you and with your spirit. We've entered into a new moment of our day. We are in the liturgy. So this response is repeated whenever the greeting occurs during mass. So it'll probably be the easiest one we all remember. Okay, there are some other greetings. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. There's also the grace and peace of God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And then one of the simple ones, the Lord be with you and also with you. So now you see the new text of the new translations there for the priest. So you'll see the changes the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship or the, and the communion of the Holy Spirit instead of fellowship. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. And then the Lord be with you and with your spirit. You see, some of these changes are just enough to trip you up, okay? <laughs> just enough to ma uh, make a, a little bit of a, an issue, with, but over time, we should be fine. Now, there's also wonderful things called pew cards that are coming out. I have a few versions here uh, as show and tell, um, and there are different versions of them, uh, and most pastors will be uh, buying up a bunch of them and putting them in the pews. They'll have all the responses for you and all of the, the various uh, greetings and things like that. And over time, you'll be able to, and once we go through the Mass for a little bit, you'll have uh, an opportunity to not even remember what was the old version or the present text, okay? The introduction to the penitential rite. We have three versions on the present text. And the new text is only one. Okay, so it drops down to one way of starting Mass. So brothers and sisters, let us acknowledge our sins and so prepare ourselves to celebrate the sacred mysteries. 
okay, for the penitential act. So you see the present text for the I confess, or the confidior. There are three choices for the penitential act. Form, form A, the confidior. Form B, which is a short dialogue. And form C, which offers us three invocations followed by the Lord or Christ have mercy. The penitential act brings out a different aspect of reconciliation. Personal wrongdoing against God and other people, God's forgiveness, and the communal aspect of sin. It begins with an invitation to recognize our place before God and shows us how God spans the wide gap between divine goodness and human beings who have sinned. This part of the Mass should not be confused with the sacramental rite of penance or the examination of conscience with that rite. The penitential act during Mass acknowledges that we are sinners while rejoicing in God's never-ending mercy and love. The confidior here, this translation, which is again a closer translation to the Latin, expresses more grandly the seriousness of our own sin and the sincerity of our contrition. It offers a humbler way to collect ourselves before stepping any further into the prayer of the liturgy. The confidior still ends with the Lord have mercy or the Kyrie eleison. Form B, which is a form that often is not used uh, by most presiders for whatever reason, maybe because we just haven't flipped the page, I'm not sure. But form B is the penitential act has been the least used, as I said, uh, but is too undergoing a complete retranslation. The option deals with the sinner's offense against God and requests healing. Salvation comes from the Latin word for the process of healing. And sometimes we seek forgiveness of sin, but not allow ourselves to experience spiritual wholeness through that forgiveness. So you see there then the new text, Lord, or I'm sorry, I'm reading this wrong side. The new text, have mercy on us, O Lord, for we have sinned against you. Show us, O Lord, your mercy and grant us your salvation. Form C, which is probably the most popular of the penitential rites, emphasizes Christ's power to forgive sins. The litany is directed to Christ, and these verses emphasize our belief in Christ who is greater than death, than darkness, and sin. It is a litany of praise for Christ who heals, who comes to save sinners, and who invites many to the heavenly banquet. The acclamation still end with Lord or Christ have mercy. So you can see that in the next slide. Here's your new text for Form C, for instance. You were sent to heal the contrite of heart. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. You came to call sinners. Christ, have mercy. Next slide. You are seated at the right hand of the Father to intercede for us. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. So you can see where the slight changes are. Again, just enough to trick people up, but uh, does have a richness attached to it. For the Gloria. The Gloria is an ancient and joyful prayer which begins with the words that the angel said at the birth of Jesus. This prayer praises God in several ways. In it we name the many wonderful things God has done, such as taking away the sins of the world. We describe what God is, or who God is, Heavenly King, Lord, Holy One. We acknowledge that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And in this hymn, we give glory to God and pray for peace to his people here on earth. It is very appropriate to begin our celebration by praising him in this way and by reminding ourselves of who our wonderful God is in our lives. The new translation of the glory is much more faithful to the original Latin prayer, and it better connects us to the Gospel of Luke, where it, is, it comes almost extensively from. At the words, you take away the sins of the world, the phrase appears in a different order in the new translation to imitate the order of the Latin translation. A small change also appears in this line. We have been singing about sin in the singular, but the new translation has sins in the plural. This difference indicates that Jesus takes away not just generic sin from the world, but also individual sin. He forgives people their personal sin. So the Latin word for sins is also in plural. Liturgy of the Word. 
there are virtually no changes to the English text to use for the Liturgy of the Word except for the Creed. The readings will conclude in the same way, the Lord be with you and thanks be to God. The proclamation of the Gospel will involve such changes to the words that proceed and conclude it. The words spoken between the priest and the deacon um, who asked for a blessing before proclaiming the Gospel have been altered slightly as well. But also when a priest proclaims the Gospel, the word and the short prayer that he offers has been altered as well for us. These, these prayers are silent and most people will never hear them anyway when we offer those prayers, um, asking God for, for assistance as we go to, to read the gospel passage. When the priest or deacon greets us before the gospel in these words, the Lord be with you, our response then will be, and with your spirit. And again, the silent prayer offers offered by the priest or deacon at the gospel end will also change slightly. So here's some text for you. Let's see, your blessing, right, good, okay. Um, the old text, the prayers before and after the gospel. Usually the deacon would say, Father, give me your blessing. Now it'll be simply your blessing, Father. By the way, just as an offside um, side point, uh, even when the deacon would ask the bishop for a, uh, uh, the blessing prior to the gospel, he says, your blessing, Father, for the new one, okay? Or, Father, give me your blessing, currently. Uh, that doesn't change. Uh, he doesn't say, you don't say, Your Excellency, you don't say, you know, Cardinal, or anything like that. No, he should say, it's part of the text, it's part of the Mass. He's celebrating is your blessing, Father. The response now will be for the priest, uh, or the bishop saying it, May the Lord be in your heart and on your lips, that you may proclaim his gospel worthily and well, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The priest says this prayer, Cleanse my heart and my lips, Almighty God, that I may worthily proclaim your holy gospel. And then we say at the end, Through the words of the gospel, may our sins be wiped away. For the Nicene Creed, this is, uh, there's some, a lot of changes here, okay? It took approximately three centuries after the death of Christ to formulate the bedrock of Christian belief. When the Emperor Constantine raised Christianity to uh, the approved religion, he encountered many theological disputes, especially the nature of Christ. Therefore, he convened the Council of Nicaea in 325, and a majority of bishops attended, attending it signed their assent to this particular creed. Right away, you will notice the move from the plural to the singular. The word credo means I believe in Latin. The, the creed is still the faith of the entire church, but each of us professes it to assert our personal faith together with all the other believers who are present. So in the Latin text, you have credo. Currently, we have we believe. So in the future, it will simply say, I believe, but we're all saying it together, okay? Another stumbling block will be consubstantial with the Father. I can't even say it myself. <laughs> the word consubstantial is certainly a mouthful. Is probably one of the one word that will engender most discussion for all of you in your churches, your parishes. It replaces the expression one in being, and it describes the relationship between Jesus and the Father. In the current translation, one in being was thought to be more comprehensive and closer to the original Greek of the creeds. However, the revised translation chooses a word that lies closer to the Latin equivalent, consubstantialis. The question on how Jesus relates to the Father is of immense importance for all of us. Heresies have divided Christians over this very issue for centuries. The early church councils forged a vocabulary that carefully articulated orthodox faith, and they chose this word to express the dogma of Jesus' divinity. The Latin word means having the same substance which is even more fundamental than being one in being. Consubstantial is a very unusual word. We don't use it for anything else, but it is describing a very unusual thing, isn't it? The Father's connection to the Son. Yes, ma'am. It is. 
but we just went through the issue of translation, dynamic, and formal equivalence. And so we're going back to, to the formal equivalence. We're utilizing the translation guidance that the church has given to us that says that they want the, the, the words that we use to pray to have a more formal way of, of looking at the word, a more equivalent approach than having something that's more dynamic in a sense or, or a broader. Is the okay. Latin text more primal for some reason other than the Greek text on some of these points? The, well, for, for, the, for Latin, but they've, they've chose in this particular reason that translators chose to go, go to the Latin because it provides the, the, the word that's in the Latin text, which is the Roman Missal that's being translated, versus a Greek text, which is not. The thing is, even among very learned people, I'm sure you're not going to find one in a hundred that's going to know the meaning of that word. The lady's asking about, she said, you're not going to find a, a one in a hundred probably who would know the meaning of that word. Uh, her question is about consubstantial, uh, and it's a question, yes, I can give you more guidance afterwards um, if you'd like, but the, the fact is that yes, but this is the word that was chosen, this is the word that's in the text, and this is the word that's going to be used. <laughs> Remember, the, the, the lady has a good point. She was saying that no one understands this word or doesn't, doesn't recognize this word. And if you, if you listen to the last part I'd like to say again, is consubstantial is an unusual word. We don't use it for anything else. Therefore, we're describing something that is unusual and different in any aspect of who we are as human beings, the relationship of Jesus to who the Father is. Therefore, we should have a word that doesn't make sense to most of us, okay, that we can use that then says what we are talking about, consubstantial, one in substance, one in the same, okay? Let's go on then. Nicene Creed. The next issue you may, may hear in uh, those um, regarding would be the word incarnate, okay? The word replaces the word born in the current translation. It means something like given flesh. It professes our belief that the word became flesh in the womb of the Virgin Mary. Our current translation could be misunderstood to state that the word became flesh when Jesus was born. This is not our faith. Jesus is not simply born by the power of the Holy Spirit. He was conceived in that way. In both translations, this phrase is followed by the statement, and became man. The new translation makes it clear that Jesus did not become a human when he was born, but he was incarnate in the womb, and in that event became man. If you continue to go on, the question now, you'll see here a match. We go down, you see we believe, and you go across. The original Latin text in the Missal says, credo, once. In the translations that we currently use, we used we believe throughout for the four major paragraphs in a sense of the creed. The Vatican said they actually like that idea because it, it helps to re-emphasize who we are in the belief. And so we now will have this translated, I believe, I believe, I believe. So if you go down the text, you'll see several instances of I believe. That's the way sometimes things happen in the church. Decisions are made, they like a certain thing, and then you go down and this is what we have. So it won't exactly be the exact translation of the, uh, the uh, Nicene Creed, but it will be what we believe together, okay? Also, the replacement of we acknowledge our sins with I confess is a more forceful expression in the context that confess means to profess belief in, not to express sorrow in this particular instance in the creed. In saying I look forward to the resurrection, we denote a much stronger, in a, in a way, a stronger emphasis and confidence that we state belief in God who gives us faith. Also changing will be the Apostles' Creed. Although it is not often prayed, the Apostles' Creed does get used sometimes in liturgy, often with children. 
and there are times when we might use it for other occasions when it's prayed. So you do not uh, need to. Um, so you do need to realize that there are changes that will be made in this this particular text as well, even though we don't use it so often at Sunday liturgy. Okay. So if you see the new text there, I believe in God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell, and on the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. So again, it will take time. Um, to get used to these. That's why those pew cards will be there. That's why you'll have your missiles if you, if you need them. They'll be out, as I said, sometime in September, hopefully. And you'll have them with you. You'll be able to follow along carefully. It, it's the same case for everyone. And one thing I should ask, please pray for your priests. <laughs> <laughs> and please tell them, okay? Do not tell them, Father, did you practice your prayers yet? <laughs> okay? Because... Uh, it will be very hard for us because we do have a lot of things that are we, we have memorized and it will, it will take some time for us to get to get used to it. Uh, Monsignor Tony Sherman, who is the outgoing executive director of the USCCB's uh, Committee on Divine uh, Worship, said to me very early on, two years ago, he said, uh, Mark, remember to tell your brother priests to practice these things because uh, and to look at them ahead of time because they will be sometimes a real, real long prayer that they'll have to follow through, and it's not the same small versions that we're used to. So, Okay, the uh, preparation of gifts. These are the prayers that we say right now for the bread and wine. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the bread we offer you, fruit of the earth and work of human hands. It will become for us the bread of life. The response will remain, blessed be God forever. This one for the wine. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the wine we offer you, fruit of the vine and work of human hands. It will become our spiritual drink. Response remains, blessed be God forever. Now this is a, a prayer that the priest will pray. With humble spirit, you may hear it sometimes when it catches the microphone. With humble spirit and contrite heart, may we be accepted by you, O Lord, and may our sacrifice in your sight this day be pleasing to you, Lord God. And then he goes to wash his hands. Wash me, O Lord, from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. So there's some slight differences there, but you can see the major text uh, changes. The Orate Fratres, that's the beginning of the, the, uh, the liturgy itself, moving into the prayer over the gifts uh, for the Eucharist. Um, pray, brethren brothers or sister and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. So that's what the, the priest will say to you. And then our response is very, very much the same. May the Lord accept the sacrifice at your hands for the praise and glory of his name, for our good and the good of all his holy church. During the liturgy of the Eucharist, most of these changes are, as I said, for priests. But after the washing of the hands, the priest extends this invitation to all who pray. Pray, brethren, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. The response, as you can see, changes only the one word. The word holy appears in Latin, so it has been added to the English translation. The reason that the Lord will hear the prayer and accept the sacrifice of the priest, the humble priest, has to do with his holiness of the church, which benefits from his prayer, the holiness of the church. The Eucharistic prayer then begins in the preface with this dialogue between priest and people. Again, you'll see the slight changes, one of them being the one we just talked about, and with your spirit, and then also it is right and just, which is just, just a straight translation of what's currently in the Latin text. The Sanctus. The first line of the Holy, Holy, Holy is straight from Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 to 3. In the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on high the lo and lofty throne, with the train of his garment filling the temple. Seraphim were stationed above, 
each of them had six wings. With two they veiled their faces, with two they veiled their feet, and with two they hovered aloft. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, they cried to one another. All the earth is filled with his glory. And so you see, holy, 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 Lord God of hosts. In the memorial acclamation, the priest says simply, the mystery of faith, leaving out the words, let us proclaim. This is similar structure to the, the other parts of the Mass. So it's more succinct in a sense. The word of the Lord was a change that we've experienced when we, uh, when we changed the, uh, the lectionaries about uh, 12 years ago now. The gospel of the Lord, the body of Christ, the blood of Christ, therefore the mystery of faith. The priest at this point in the Eucharistic prayer is in the midst of a lengthy prayer directed to God the Father. Instead of changing the focus towards let us proclaim and then back to the Father, the simple phrase, which is a prompt and prompts a response, is simply more fitting to the translation. It also, the words let us proclaim imply that he will also be making the acclamation during Mass, which is not the case. The priest does not offer that. It's the mystery of faith and the people respond. In the current translation, we have four acclamations from which to choose. These were based on three different ones in the original Latin. The acclamation, which is probably best known, Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again, has no close parallel in the Latin, but was an adaptation allowed in the U.S. alone. So you will notice that this acclamation will no longer be used in the new Missal. Therefore, you have to remember that what I've tried to do at my liturgies when I'm celebrating Mass is to refrain from using that particular response to just get everybody starting to focus um, out of it. It might make sense for you to also advise some of your priests to do the same and also your music programs because it is not in there. It was requested as an adaptation by the bishops to the Vatican. It didn't come back with it and so it will not be in the new Missal. Um, and so we will not have that, that particular version, but we will have three others that we can use. So it's not like we're, we're, uh, we're just taking out a whole part of the, of the liturgy, but it might make sense to start to phase that out of your memory in a sense, okay? Uh, the first option of the Eucharist acclamations reflects a more faithful rendering of the Latin text. Instead of three brief statements that build in intensity, this translation shows the connection between the dying and rising of Christ and the way we proclaim it in anticipation of his coming. So we proclaim your death, O Lord, and profess your resurrection until you come again. The second one, when we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim your death, O Lord, until you come again. There's no hardly any change there, as you can see, just a couple of words that have, uh, have been adjusted. The text is simply a better reflection of the Latin, which did not specifically include the name of Jesus. In the final option, you see the word order has changed and now offers an explicit prayer to Jesus who saves us. This connection or the connections between the component parts of the acclamation are also clarified and Jesus has set free, uh, uh, has set us free by his cross and resurrection. And for this reason, we ask him to save us. The introduction to the Lord's Prayer. Again, yes, sir. The second version? Right. The second version does not contain a reference to Jesus in the Latin, so they took it out. So is there going to be an issue when your musicians, uh, home wise and music wise, when they do that musical, they, they kind of say Lord Jesus? So yeah. This gentleman is asking a question about the uh, Eucharistic acclama or the, uh, acclamations in which uh, will be set to music. Now, that's a whole other area of, of liturgy in a way, music and liturgy. Uh, the National Pastoral Musicians Association has been offering workshops for musicians uh, to begin the process of practicing the various uh, um, settings, in a sense, that are, are being used. Uh, we had one here, actually. Tom Staley organized one here uh, at the cathedral. Uh, recently, MPM did run one at uh, the cathedral across the river in Arlington for musicians. There are some others going around. They have an extensive 
uh, program available for uh, their musicians or for musicians who are going to be practicing. Those settings are coming out and they're, they're getting them now and they'll be utilizing them, I'm sure, most directors. Okay, I understand, but I wanted to ask a question. Uh, Lord Jesus versus O Lord. Where's, Correct. Where's the, 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 the Latin text did not include, it did not include a reference specifically to Jesus. So they took it out in that. As we proclaim your death, O Lord, and profess your resurrection until you come again. Okay? It comes from the Latin text. The old, actually comes the, from the old Latin yeah. text. Okay. okay. So go to uh, introduction to the Lord's Prayer. Okay. So you'll see now there are multiple options currently under the present text to introduce. And again, the Latin uh, Missal only had one. These were adaptations that were added in the second edition, or the first edition and in the second edition when it went to the vernacular. They're going to this point. We're just going with the one uh, reference to, to introduce the, uh, the Lord's Prayer. At the Savior's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to say all together. The Lord's Prayer does not change, but you have the embolism which does. Embolism means insertion or the, the piece that comes at the, uh, the end in between the, 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 the prayer and the doxology. Jesus, uh, deliver us, Lord, we pray from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. So there's enough changes in there. You can see them. But that's a prayer that the priest has to say, not you. You don't have to worry about it too much. <laughs> Sign of peace. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. And then the sign of peace, the peace of the Lord be with you always. And then we have that and with your spirit. Okay. Private prayers that the priest will use just so you can see them. And go to the next slide. Priest, uh, there's a couple here. Uh, there are a couple differences. The second one is much more, is adjusted slightly. The first one has a little more changes to it. We'll skip to the next slide, which would be invitation to communion. Okay. So now you see here in the new text, the present text and the new text, behold the Lamb of God is actually closer to the Latin in a more direct allusion to John 1, 29, where John the Baptist points out to his followers. The word also happy is replaced by blessed. You may be blessed even when experiencing sorrow. And this together with the reference to the Supper of the Lamb makes clear the allusion to Revelation 19, 9. There, the angel in the vision has John write down the words that proclaim, Blessed are those called to the wedding banquet of the Lamb. In our reply, receive you becomes that you should enter under my roof. This makes a direct connection to Matthew 8, 8 and also Luke 7, 6 where a Gentile centurion has asked Jesus to heal his servant. Jesus intends to go to the house, but the centurion believes himself unworthy to have Jesus come to his home. So Jesus admires the man's faith and cures the servant from afar. So it's a direct connection to that. Some Catholics have complained about the word roof being used. It is not the roof of one's mouth. <laughs> Your words are about sinfulness, not about a part of body. We're imitating the humility of the centurion so that Jesus will not avoid us because of our sins, but will come to us on strength of our virtue as well. We're asking for him to be present with us. The priest's communion, you see these prayers, just, I'll just show them to you. May the body of Christ keep me safe for eternal life. May the blood of Christ keep me safe for eternal life. Those are the prayers he, he offers as he receives. And then the prayer after the cleansing of the vessels. 
What is past our lips as food, O Lord, may we possess in purity of heart, that what has been given to us in time may be our healing for eternity. Again, you can see that they're trying with the, the poetic way of approaching things. The concluding rite. Finally, as um, in, with other instances of the Mass, you'll see again, the and with your spirit. Now, you also may hear new words for the dismissal. The new translations offer some new options for the priest and the deacon. Go ahead, go to the next slide. Okay. So you'll see, go forth, the Mass is ended. Go and announce the gospel of the Lord. Go in peace, glorifying the Lord by your life. And go in peace. These translations remind us that when Mass concludes, we do not just leave the building, but we enter the world on mission. So our response also the remains, thanks be to God. So you can see where the adjustments are. So we have addition, the two additional ones uh, that have come to us actually come from Pope Benedict XVI himself. He added those in um, to offer this idea or this concept that when we leave church, we are on mission together into the world. Okay, let's look at the prayers themselves so we can understand what we're praying in a way. Examples from the New Translation. These are how the prayers are sort of set up for you. As you notice that there is an address to God, which sometimes embellishes almighty everlasting God. There's an attribute, which says something about who God is. There's a petition, which states what our need is, and then a statement of mediation. Okay, so if you take a look at that prayer that's present there on the slide, almighty and everlasting God, who is in your overflowing compassion, surpass the merits and de desires of those who pray, pour out your mercy upon us, which is the petition, to pardon what conscience dreads, and to add what prayer does not venture to ask through our Lord Jesus Christ, etc., etc. Okay? Go ahead and go to the next. Just skip that one. Yeah, okay. Some more examples for you. You can see how these things have changed over time. You'll see the 1975 version. Then you see the Latin version in 2002, which is where the translations are coming from, and then the 2010 version. It's probably hard for those who are in the back uh, to see that, but I'll, I'll read them for you. In the 75 version, Father, you revealed your Son to the nations by the guidance of a star. Lead us to your glory in heaven by the light of faith. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ. The 2010 version has a little mo more poetry. This is for Epiphany Sunday. O God, who on this day revealed your only begotten Son to the nations by the guidance of a star, grant in your mercy that we who know you now by faith may be brought to behold the beauty of your sublime glory. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Another example would be Wednesday of the second week of Easter. The 1975 prayer says, Merciful Father, may these mysteries give us new purpose and bring us to a new life in you. Grant this through Christ our Lord. Now it reads, Graciously be present to your people, we pray, O Lord, and lead those you have nourished with heavenly mysteries to pass to a new way of life from the old. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The sense of passing over or transi or, uh, tran to transit from the old to the new uh, is important because it's celebrated in the Easter season and since it was lost in the former translation, so they added it back in. Just an example. Okay. Preparing for the changes in the church. Now this is what we were getting to briefly about the issue of consubstantiation, uh, uh, because consubstantial with the Father. Um, the liturgical changes are a fact of the church now, okay? So the changes in these translations for the Missal will occur, period, okay? It's going to happen. The books have been sent to the, the, the final versions have been sent to the publishers. The publishers are, are printing them up. The pew cards are coming out. I'm going around the diocese telling people that this is happening. In dioceses around the country, the same thing is happening 
and also which came up from uh, another question I didn't uh, speak about um, was somebody asked me uh, during the break is this taking place in other languages yes it is also going to take place in all of the other languages once the Latin text was promulgated by John Paul II it necessitated a third edition of the Roman Missal in the vernacular so the Spanish eventually will come out the German will, uh, will, will come out the French will eventually have a new version. The Italians will eventually have a new ver version. But we have our new version now because they've been working on it for, for these 10 years or so. And also, ours is sometimes used as a foundation for the translations elsewhere. Okay? So they go from the English, not particularly from the Latin. Okay? So they use the English, and so that is an also uh, a reason why we're, we're out early, in a so sense. Well, okay? Yeah. Right. We are ahead of the curve, that's right. Okay, so the changes will occur. It's a given, and it's, but it's not given on how, as priests or people, we prepare, receive, or implement these changes. Preparation is critical for how the changes will be received by all of our people. Our preparation must include a catechesis as best you can, um, in broader uh, way of understanding what is taking place. I gave you a lot of material. There's a very good book on your, on your uh, tables there that you have from Paul Turner. He's a very well-known writer uh, for the church. He's a priest. Uh, he's a very well-known liturgist, and it's probably the best piece out there that I've been able to find uh, in the years that I've been kind of researching and trying to put materials together for the diocese. The other materials that I put on the, uh, the uh, tables there for you there is a, a glossary of terms. There are the people's parts and priest parts for you, uh, as well as uh, a little summary of this entire uh, workshop or lecture, so you can follow uh, and refresh your memory in the future. It's important for you to think about how, as a committee, in a sense, in a parish, or in your own parish with your parish priest, how you're going to go about uh, catechizing or teaching. About 50% of the people will accept, okay, regardless, all right? About 25% are going to accept with explanation, and about 25% are not going to accept, <laughs> okay? Just, that's just the way it's going to be, unfortunately. Um, we also have the issue of our, our, our dear beloved brothers and sisters who like to come on an occasional basis to the church. <laughs> Uh, Christmas and Easter, we must think about them as well. Make sure they have you have pew cards ready for them and things like that. Okay, so uh, we want to be kind and welcoming to them. Okay, so our preparation is important as we as we get closer to to the implementation. It's important as leaders that we bear a responsibility to help self and then others learn why the liturgical changes are happening and to embrace them and what the changes have meant. Okay, we talked a little bit about the philosophy of translation. These things are things that have been given to us by the church. None of us had any part really to play in, in the change of uh, philosophy, dynamic equivalence to formal equivalence. I don't know. Anybody work in the Vatican? <laughs> no. Okay? So none of us really, these are things that we, in a way, have to accept in obedience and in love with the understanding that these decisions are not made lightly, they're not made in, in a way that they were hurried. Matter of fact, they're saying they're trying to correct some of the changes that were made in a hurry. Uh, and so you have to remember that. And these are the things that you want to start to think about on how you would explain that to someone else who's going to be right in the pew saying, you're an extraordinary minister. So it means you are a leader in the parish, you see? Why is this happening? Or you are a catechist to the kids. You're a teacher. How are you going to teach it? You can get the book from uh, Cardinal Whirl. I, if you give it to me ahead of time, I'll get, get a signature in it for you. <laughs> but uh, no, he's actually doing book signings coming up. Uh, there's another one coming up on the 12th at the Shrine, if you're interested. So, um, but that's, that's the general idea, is to start coming up with uh, your general explanation on how you're going to. There are not too many controversial things. We talked about the consubstantial. We talked about the word incarnate. There aren't a lot of changes uh, and remember, we are not changing the Mass. Monsignor told me this a story uh, several years ago when I started out researching this uh, in this process and 
went to the Georgetown's liturgy uh, program to talk to them about what they knew was taking place and things like that. That's when I first heard that Paul Turner would be writing uh, uh, this booklet. A booklet. So, um, but Monsignor told me a story about how uh, the changes for Vatican II came about, and there was very little planning and very little. Uh, 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 and so, the, but that was the entire mass that changed. The way we did mass was changing. Uh, and it was going into the vernacular. Now, the Mass is not changing. Some of the words that we use are being adjusted. Some of the words we, are, we use are being enriched. Changed, yes, but they're being enriched for us to keep us in focus on what we're into, uh, entering into. So it's not just a liturgy in which we sit down as if we were sitting down across the street of Jack's Fresh or uh, somewhere else in, in the diocese but that we are coming together as a community of faith to pray, to worship, and to love God. And that liturgy, in a sense, what we're coming to, is what's enriching us. And the words that we use are then would help us to understand that we're present in that very special moment and not just any other different moment that we're existing in. Okay. Some of the other things that you need to know uh, for parish leadership. Go to the next slide. Oh, I skipped one there. Sorry, go back. The issue of the diocesan bishop. The, the bishop is the chief liturgist, and so he's the one who ultimately has the responsibility for the souls in his diocese, ultimately has the responsibility for making, making decisions. But also he's a part of the other bishops, the USCCB, the Conference of Bishops, who speak together collectively. And it's, they're the ones who have worked on this over the years, uh, they're the ones who asked for adaptations if they could have them. They got some, they didn't get others. And they're the ones then who are responsible for telling us when we're going to start this. And they decided that we would have it for November 27th at the end of this year. We're starting at a new season, which is important. You see, we're in one season and we'll just move into a new season. The Advent season starts the liturgical year. It's an opportunity time, good opportunity to, 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 to make a change in a sense. It's helpful for all of us. Okay. So for parish leadership, the success of implementing this new Roman Missal really falls on most of you. Uh, the primary responsibility is catechesis on the liturgy, and the reception will be based on what we all do. So yes, it includes the U.S. bishops, the USCCB, the Committee on Divine Worship, the secretaries of various divine worship offices like myself. Um, and, uh, but it also really, it will be the pastors and the priests and the leadership of a parish who helps implement these things. So the implementation of the process should be an opportunity for catechesis on liturgy, the whole part of liturgy and understand what liturgy means. Why do we come together? How do we celebrate? What's the purpose of our celebration? But also think about this, an opportunity to renew the way your program takes place. If you are in charge of extraordinary ministers, Perhaps you might want to uh, take this opportunity. The change is another opportunity to refresh, uh, to renew, to teach some of the basics over again to those ministers who are still working, perhaps looking to, to the future and trying to get other ministers to come and join you and to be a part of that experience. Same for lectors, uh, same for those who are involved in any aspect of the parish life. It doesn't have to be specifically the liturgy, but it could be those who volunteer um, and as greeters in, hosp uh, in hospitality as well. So it's an opportunity for catechesis for everyone. And how smoothly it goes depends carefully on our preparation, on our opportunity. You are here because you're concerned, you're intelligent individuals, and you want to be a part of what's taking place. Use your intelligence to study up. We've given you some materials. There will be, uh, our website is up and running. The USCCB has a website. There are a lot of liturgical sites that are focused on ours. So if you go to the, the website for the diocese, uh, you'll see the Roman Missal uh, link. Go into that, you'll see all lots of information on how to uh, touch up. We're being recorded today, so this presentation could be uh, then cut and spliced, taking certain parts out, of course. <laughs> um, and placed on the website as well. So you'll be able to go back to the website and refresh your memory uh, in the process, okay? Um, think positively. Yes, change is not easy for us. Nobody likes a lot of change in their routine, but also think positively being something, it's exciting, it's an opportunity. Uh, it's not simply a change that's taking place. 
The liturgy is the center of our church's life, and doing it well is part of our responsibility. It's part of every one of us. And that's why um, on Senior Night Knows, we spend a lot of time on just trying to figure out how to do the liturgies that we have with the, with the Cardinal. Um, you know, how to make it uh, good, how to make it well executed, how to make it uh, run smoothly. And that takes preparation, it takes time, it takes thought ahead before you actually do it. Who would want to go out into the sanctuary for a public mass without thinking about it ahead of time, right? So same thing, same idea. We would want to, you would want to do the same thing before you enter into this. Okay. Um, so we do it well because it's part of our responsibility and being a part of Christ's mission in this world. And then also our attitude and our gentle patience. We need to be patient, right? <laughs> Definitely need to be patient with the changes. Um, I've been giving this workshop now around the diocese, and I'm just now starting to get used to some of the words, okay, myself. So it takes patience for all of us, and to know it will take time for some more than others, but over time we will all get that where we're supposed to be and where the church wants us to be, okay? So we plan for success. Everyone will face challenges. Uh, careful attention will be paid to implementing the changes for our prayers and responses. Probably the easiest way to facilitate this will be to use the pew cards to help with that. So each worshiper will actually have a clear text ahead of them. And this is particularly challenging when only a few words have been changed in any particular response. So do we have pew cards. I'll show you a bunch of versions. The publishers are now starting to come out with them. So they're available. So there's like this little booklet form. Um, there's a larger version for those of you who are like me and aging a little bit and uh, might need reading glasses soon. Uh, a Sunday visitor just came out with a beautiful one. Uh, there's two versions of this. This is the Mass at a Glance. Remember I spoke about an opportunity of re-educating ourselves. Okay, so they've gone through here and they've taken care of it for you. So uh, they have the Mass at a Glance, explanations of the different parts of the liturgy, but then also you have the card itself which provides the actual responses that you would need, okay? Um, gentleman over here had spoken briefly about musicians. The musicians will be adding, uh, doing their, their part to learn the new parts and things like that that are, have been set to, to music. But also, uh, many of the publishers are gonna be providing inserts that will go into the, the book hymnals that are in the pews. So because you know a lot of the uh, hymnals have a section that has the liturgy itself, uh, and so that will, they'll, they'll be able to put those in as well. So it depends. And that's a decision that you can help your pastor with, or in this case, uh, rector, uh, on how to go about doing that. How do you best communicate the exact changes that will take place in the liturgy? Do we put them in the songbooks? Do we put them in the pews? How do we uh, go about doing that? Um, for, uh, just so you know, as, as individuals, uh, we have about six priests. Right now I have four online, but uh, two more are coming soon who will be working on homily helps for our priests, how to go about preaching, as well as incorporating the changes that are coming. Uh, so they'll be online for our priests to be able to use this uh, help or hints. Um, and uh, so we'll, we'll publish those to them separately. But that's uh, another opportunity. But utilize the website because uh, with modern technology now, we have the opportunity to have video uh, you can go on to a number of these uh, liturgy sites that have podcasts or video podcasts, I guess they call them, and you can actually see a quick explanation of a certain part of the liturgy, and you can use that. So if you get a question, you can, uh, you can deal, uh, deal with it fairly easily. Um, one other thing also, uh, think about the question of expense for your, to help advise your pastor on the expense of things, because you want to be able to... Um, materials you may need for your class or your your uh, uh, for your teaching purposes or for the parish itself um, to utilize in a sense your budgeting issues okay um, so to summarize here we got a plan for our success everyone will face challenges so our careful attention our musicians are learning now their their new repertoires there's a challenge for all priest presiders to make sure that these these prayers are familiar to us and not just uh, memorized and then the brain will kick in and bring us to 1975 again. Uh, the priest cannot take us uh, take for granted any of the prayers. That's very important to think about, to remember the, that they, they can't. 
So remind them of that, as I said. Okay, next slide. Change is a fact for all of us. Okay, these are, these are for, in a sense, you can start thinking about how you would respond to people. Change is a fact for all of us, growing from infancy to adulthood, from ignorance to knowledge, from selfishness to generosity, from self-centeredness to self-giving. So we change all the time. It's a fact of life. Over time, we learn. And so this is just another part of who we are and where we are in the church's life at the moment. Our responses to change are varied. Sometimes we anticipate and accept. Sometimes we are enthusiastic and we are creative about it. Sometimes we accept and integrate that. Sometimes we resist and also have a sense of loss or feel a sense of loss, indifference or non-acceptance or shock or total refusal. That will happen. It happened under the changes of Vatican II. But again, as I remind you, the Mass is really not changing much. It's a few words. So hopefully we'll uh, be able to make through it, the, the, the process. Next slide. So our attitude is key. Recognize those challenges. Be patient. Be understanding. And begin the conversation now with your friends and uh, those who you work with in the parishes because now's the, now's the time.